Hello and welcome to another Bible Shorts video teaching session. Um, we are going to be continuing on our series, Serving God is Easy. We would have already touched on Sabbath, and now we are going to speak to another controversial issue, which needs not or need not have all this controversy surrounding it. Um, but so it goes with religion. And when we take the things of God that he made for our benefit and things that are very simple and we for ourselves go and make them difficult. So we would be starting in Genesis chapter 14. And just to give you some context, um, this was a time where a group of kings, one group of kings, did battle with another group, right? So you would have had um, a power structure in place. Um, some of these kings, they decided, you don't know what? You know what? I don't think, I don't find we should continue to serve these other people. Um, let's see if we could come out from under their yoke. These kings didn't like that. They say, all right, let's go and deal with these guys. So there was, um, of course, the ensuing battle. And the kings or the group of kings that Sodom and Gomorrah were part of, they were on the losing side. And Abram's nephew, Lot, he was living in the region of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was captured, right? So if we read in verse 11, um, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshol. Okay, going down. <laughs> so, 14. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan, right? So when Abram heard that his nephew was taken, um, even being just a private citizen, right? He was not a king. Um, he got mixed up in the business of kings as a private citizen. He took a small army. And he went to recover, right? Um, so verse 15, it says, he divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. So all that to say, Abraham was successful in retrieving his nephew. Right now, what does all this have to do with tithing? And when we say tithing, it's simply speaking about giving 10% of your income to um, a particular group or an organization. Right, so you are giving 10%. That, that is all it is giving 10%. So then we have a, a character being introduced here, another king. Right. So I think before we had nine kings because it was, um, I believe, five kings versus four kings. Right. And now we have another king being mentioned, Melchizedek, and he is the king of Salem. And it says he brought out bread and wine. And it also says that he was the priest of God most high. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He said, blessed be Abram. Well, his name wasn't changed as yet. Blessed be Abram, God of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God. So he's speaking a blessing upon Abram. And he's also blessing the God of heaven, the most high God. Who has done what? Who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now, remember, Abram was just minding his own business, um, going about life, serving God, when all of this happened, right? And here what it says, finally, 
and he gave him a tithe of all. Now the person who did the giving here was Abram. So Abram went to battle because one of his family members had an issue, right? God is the one who gave him the victory in this battle because most likely he would have been going after um, and battling with people with superior numbers, right? He was just a private citizen. Um, he was pursuing some kings who had just defeated our next set of kings, right? And God gave him victory. Then this priest of God, who, as we read further down, we would recognize it is never mentioned that Melchizedek ever had any interaction with Abram again after this, right? But Abram gives him one-tenth of all. Um, we are not sure if it is, um, or we can assume, I, I guess we could assume that this is a tenth of all the spoil he had recovered from the battle that he just fought, right? So he went into battle, he was victorious, he was able to recover his family members, and he was able to recover even more stuff. And when we read further down, we will see that even the king of Sodom, Right here, what the king says, he says, look, give me the people and you take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. So look at where Abram's heart is. He basically told this king, um, where in, uh, in this sort of scenario, somebody would be glad to know that, hey, wait a minute, I am getting to rub shoulders um, with a king. I am getting to, to, to do something for a king. Look, a king wants to reward me. The average person would be happy to receive that reward. Abram says, listen, I don't want anything from you because I don't want you to take the glory that belongs to God. So down the road, you want to say, I am the one who made Abram rich because Abram understood that his victory, his blessings, his substance, his promotion, his increase all came from God. And here was a priest representing the God he served, the God who gave him all of these things in the first place. So he says to himself, I am going to give to this priest one-tenth of all God has blessed me with, right? So you see, tithing is very simple. Abraham did this out of love and recognition for his God. Right, He recognized God is the one who blessed me. I am giving God what is his in the first place. Right, And if God has blessed me with what I already have, I am trusting God to continue to bless me in the future. I am trusting God to continue to protect me. I am trusting God to continue to give me victory. So Abraham didn't pay this out of some obligation, right? Melchizedek did not ask him for this. There is no record that Melchizedek says, I am the priest of God, so you have to bring money to me. You have to give me money from what um, you earn. No, what we know, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, right? Um, he was a servant of God. Abram also served God. So these two servants met up. One blessed the other, being in the office of priest, right? Um, so the other person now who receives the blessing in return says, listen, I am also going to give something for you. So what it also shows is that Abram considered the blessing he received to be even greater than the, the money or the resources that he gained out of that battle. So look at where Abram's heart is. And now look at some of the reasons 
for all this controversy over the paying of tithes because number well one we have many times some people in the office of the priests in the office of the leaders who put burdens on people to pay this thing we call tithes right they make it burdensome they make it as if people have to do this out of obligation right you have to do this out of law and if you do not do it you will be cursed so not only are they trying to force people to do it as obligation they are also now instead of blessing the people of god they now want to attach curses to this thing so if you don't do it you will be cursed and then you have even those who are taking the tithes demanding tithes um, like Eli's sons would have done. They, they were demanding of the offering, right? To live in unrighteousness, just to build up themselves, to enrich themselves, to continue in their own greed and their own sinful ways. But this has nothing to do with the people. If you are tithing, that is something that should be between you and your God right? Not out of obligation, because Abram didn't do it out of obligation. Abram received victory. He was happy that he was victorious because he saved something precious to him, right? His family member. He also was able to increase himself and, and, and recover some more, but that wasn't the big thing. The main thing for Abram was rescuing his nephew and then on top of that he received a blessing from god so this is where our heart should be we should be given because we want to be able to help somebody else we should be given because we want to contribute to our family in god or our family in christ because if you are attending an assembly then this should be your family Right, And you understand that when you give, that is probably also going to add to the assembly. It's probably going to help somebody else who might have a need. Right, So his heart was not on, well, I have to do this out of obligation. And if I don't do this, I will be cursed. Right, So let's look at somebody else now. Now let's look at Jacob. So again, just for a little backstory. Jacob was leaving um, the family home. If you read before, you would see it had a little bacchanal, what we would call bacchanal with him and his brother. Um, Jacob used some trickery, right, to get the blessing of the firstborn. But his brother Esau was in no way innocent as well, right? However, it we reached a point where Jacob is being sent away to go to get himself a wife. Now, something happens to Jacob. As he leaves from Beersheba to go on his journey, it says he came to a certain place and stayed there all night. So we're in verse 11 right now in Genesis chapter 28, right? Um, and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it at his head and he lay down to sleep. Then he got a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and the top of the ladder reached to heaven, and angels of God were going up and coming down on the ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father. So at this point, Abraham, Abram's name was changed to Abraham, right? Um. So the Lord God now, the God of heaven, is referring to himself as I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, right? So God is identifying with Abraham and Isaac because they made the God of heaven their God. So he's saying, just as I was with them, I will be with you. And he said, the land on which you lie. So this place that you are sleeping right now, I will give it to you and your descendants. So he is having an encounter with God. Also, your descendants shall be as dust of the earth. So God is making a promise to him, a promise of blessing, right? 
behold, um, where did I reach? And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God is speaking a blessing again upon Jacob. He says, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So the Lord is blessing Jacob. He's making a promise to Jacob, right? He's covenanting with Jacob. He's identifying himself with the faith that was in Abraham and Isaac. And he's basically telling Jacob, I expect the same faith to be with you because I am already committing myself to you to help you and to bless you and to fulfill the words that I spoke to you and to fulfill the promises that I made to your fathers. Then Jacob woke up and he said, wow, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know, right? How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So this was his response. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Right, but the name of the city had been Luz or Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow, and here was what he said If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So we could say at this point. Jacob is still on his journey to be to be fully convict, convinced and fully convicted in his stand. Yes, I know you are the God of my grandfather, Abraham. Yes, I know you are the God of my father, Isaac. But do this thing for me. Take care of me because I'm going on a journey. I'm not sure what is going to happen. Take care of me on my journey. Bring me back safely. And then you will also be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth or a tithe to you. So look at what Jacob is saying. Once again, he's recognizing that it is all about God. God, if you bless me and take care of me, I will acknowledge you as my God. Well, I dare say for us, especially us who are already in Christ, God has already fulfilled his promise in our lives. God has already committed himself for us. God has already sent a sacrifice for us. God has already become our God and we have accepted him as such. So if Jacob is saying, I will give a tenth just because I accept you as my God because of the goodness you have shown towards me, what other reason do we need? This had nothing to do with obligation. This is Jacob saying to his God, listen, you take care of me, you bless me, and from the blessing that you give me, I will give back in some way. Because I recognize that if you bless me today, you will bless me tomorrow. If you bless me this week, you are more than able to bless me next week. If you bless me this month, I am also looking to you to bless me the following month, right? And when you bless me and you increase me and you provide for me, what is it? Is it a big deal that I should give a portion of it away? That I should dedicate a portion of it to you out of love? So Jacob wasn't doing this out of some obligation. This was not a burden to him. Jacob was happy to have done this. The same way Abram would have been happy to do it out of love for God, out of God's own faithfulness being manifested in their lives. So a good reason 
a great reason for us to pay tithes is simply because God has been good to us and we are happy about it. So you should be happy to give your tithe. You should be happy to do that because when you give 10, it means what you really received was 100. When you give 100, it is because you received 1,000, so you are celebrating. And if I can receive 100 or 1,000, then God can do that for me again. So what am I losing? I am recognizing that it is God who owns everything in the first place. I am doing this as a sign of my love for God. And not only that, just as we see even with Abraham, but also as a sign of my love for the brethren, right? Jesus said, listen, this is the command I leave with you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So if you are given just out of obligation, right? As if it is some burden like paying taxes or how some people feel about paying taxes, especially when you, you might find you're paying taxes, but you are not seeing the benefits of the taxes that you are paying, right? This should not be something like that because we serve a good and loving God. So we should be happy to give as he has also given to us. Now look at something else here. And this is not even scripture, right? What I looked up here was personal, um, personal finance management, right? And this is what the world has to say about managing your personal finances. This is what the experts of the world have to say. This has nothing to do with religion, right? And here what they say as um, one of their main points, right? They are saying that um, a general rule of thumb according to the 50, 30, 20 budgeting rule is to put 20% of your after-tax income towards your savings. So wait a minute. Even in the world, they are saying you should be living off of less than you earn. They are say, telling you and I, we should put 20% towards savings, right? Because we are trying to put for that rainy day, we are trying to, to build up and have increase for the future. Yeah, we're trying to save against unforeseen circumstances. So something happens, we have something put aside, right? When you look at wealth creation principles, similar um, rules apply. They will tell you, you need to put some money towards savings. You also need to put some money towards investment. Right? So if we don't have a problem putting money towards saving, if we don't have a problem putting money towards investing, and the same world and worldly teachers and, and financial gurus and leaders also tell us we should be charitable. So if in the world they are recognizing that you should be putting aside some money, whether it be in a bank, in a mutual fund, whether it be in stocks and bonds or some other form of investment, whether it be even given to charity, they are saying all these things you should be doing. And the world is not fighting and arguing and making this some big bacchanal. Why are we, as people of God, who should be doing these things out of love, why are we making tithing something burdensome? and something to cause confusion and contention and bacchanal, right? We should be happy to give because we believe in what we are doing. We believe in the God that we serve. We have faith and we are trusting that, listen, God, this is just me doing something out of love. And some of the side benefits of it is also helping you develop financial discipline. But you are not tithing for financial discipline. You are not tithing for financial increase. These are things that will happen as additional benefits. You are doing it out of love, out of gratitude, because God has delivered you 
because God continues to deliver you, because God is also concerned about delivering those that concern you, your loved ones. You are tithing because God has blessed you and will speak blessings upon you through other people, through the people in your fellowship, right? The Lord will use these people to pray for you, yeah? to fellowship, to, to, and he says, iron sharpens iron to help you grow in your own spiritual journey, right? So we give out of love. Tithing is something that should be done out of love and not out of any obligation, right? God is our God. So listen, serving God is easy, Giving is something that even the world tells us to do. So let's not make giving something burdensome. Let's not use it as a reason to curse people and to put hexes on people and to threaten them, right? And corrupt something so simple that God has designed and introduced for our own benefit. So once again, remember, serving God is easy. Do not allow religion, do not allow people, do not allow the corrupt and the wicked practices of people to keep you from developing a healthy relationship with your God and doing the simple things, yeah, that add to your spiritual development. So blessings to you, blessings to your family. And we will continue with some more topics in this series. Serving God is easy.